Welcome everybody again to another episode of the Idea Me Show. I'm Andrea McDonald, the founder of Idea Me. Idea Me is a global podcast available in 40 countries worldwide, a creator series and mentor program. This episode concerns itself with a breakthrough in restoring or the pathway to restoring vision to the blind. I'm here with the director of the Netherlands Institute for Neuroscience. Who are you? So my name is Pieter Rofsema. Um, I studied medicine. But if you feel ill, you don't want me besides your bed because I went into science, studied the visual system. And a few years ago, we thought all that knowledge that we now have, why don't we start thinking about creating a device that restores a rudimentary form of vision for blind people. Um, there are over 40 million uh, blind people worldwide, um, over 2 billion uh, visually impaired, um, over 1 billion um, visu um, visually impaired that could where, where it could have been avoided. Um, could you explain um, the process through which uh, a human being receives vision or, or a non-visually impaired human being receives vision and the pathway to the brain. So the information that comes into your eye is uh, made uh, as a sharp image on the back of your eye where your retina is. Then the information from the retina is sent through the optic nerve to a region uh, in the midbrain called the thalamus and from there it's sent on to the back of our brain there's a, a region that's called primary visual cortex and that region has a very accurate two-dimensional representation of the outside world where two points that are nearby in the outside world will map on to two points in your brain that are also nearby so it's a very systematic map of the outside world and could you talk a little bit about the, um, the, the, the solution that you are providing and uh, how it doesn't actually deal with uh, addressing issues in the eye, it, it, it deals with uh, addressing issues in the brain or the back of the brain in the visual cortex. Yeah, so what, what we know from previous work is that uh, if you put an electrode in that region, I was just alluding to the primary visual cortex, <clears throat> then um, you can put a little bit of current on it and you can stimulate the nerve cells that are nearby. An electrode is just a wire actually. And so these nerve cells will become active and a person can also be a person who has been blind for several years, will perceive a dot of light and, and at that location that corresponds to the position of this two-dimensional map I was talking about. So if you then stimulate with another wire, a group of electrodes that are nearby, this person see, will see another dot of light that is close to the first dot of light. If you then have a whole series of wires, a whole series of electrodes, then you basically are addressing a, a part of the map and you can place dots in the person's perception at many, many different locations. And you can work with it like a matrix board. So if I'm going to stimulate one electrode, you're going to see a dot of light, but if you stimulate uh, like in a matrix board, if you switch on a, a single bulb, you will see a dot. But on a matrix board, you can also switch on several bulbs in the, in the shape of a letter or, or convey other meaningful information. And we could do the same thing if you have many electrodes in the visual cortex. You can just switch on uh, uh, dot perceptions at many different locations and thereby convey meaningful information. Now, if a person would have such a prosthesis, which still needs to be developed further, this person would carry a camera, it can be uh, embedded in, in glasses, then that, that camera image will be sent to a processor, maybe the size of a phone, that translates these camera images into brain stimulation patterns that are, are then going to be sent to those electrodes, maybe wirelessly. So that's something also that needs to be developed. So right now the, the brain computer interfaces, many of them, they actually have a, a wire coming out of, of the skull to make the connection between to the brain. Now, of course, in a future device that is safe and, and that can be used easily, you would like all these things to be completely wireless. 
uh, work in this area first started in the 1970s. Could you explain to the audience why uh, the research that you head up uh, represents such a breakthrough? Yes, so there was a fantastic researcher in, uh, in the UK. His name was Giles Brindley. He was already doing this in the 60s and in the early 70s. It's really remarkable because he already made a system that was wireless. So basically he had small coils, small kind of wire coils under the skin, several of them, actually more than 100. And he then used a, a coil on the outside to induce current in a coil under the skin. And that run, then he ran a wire to the visual cortex and was able to stimulate uh, brain cells. That was amazing that he could already do that back then. Of course, we are now 50 years later and we have improved technology. So our game is easier. So we have better ways to interface with the brain. Actually back then, he also put electrodes on the surface of the brain. We have found out that it's, you can uh, get perceptions with less current if you have an electrode, the wire really inside the brain. So that's, that's an advantage. Uh, we had actually 1,000 electrodes in the experiment that we recently did in monkeys. And um, so we have basically more pixels from which we can build uh, a mental image. Uh, and of course, there are other advances now. So it's better electrode technology. We have now wireless chips that can, of course, digest much more information. So I think this is the right time to make, uh, to make this happen. Could you explain a little bit about how the eBrain's um, brain at, 3D uh, brain at atlas has, has helped you in advancing this research? Yes, so eBrain's is part of the Human Brain Project and um, it's a collection of services that the Human Brain Project or its successor will offer to the neuroscience community. Now, for our research, we have to kind of take the shape of this visual cortex where we want to implant electrodes into account. And the shape of the visual cortex is complicated. It has all kinds of folds. We call them sulci. And uh, they are different between individuals. So we need to devise a strategy to implant electrodes, a sufficient number of electrodes. We're thinking about thousands of electrodes. And we, have, we want to make sure that most of them are, are positioned in the right location. And that's where eBrains is, is tremendously helpful because they have the anatomical knowledge and they can also provide some of the tools that allow us to do the correct mapping. Um, you have mentioned in your paper that, that there are uh, a number of uh, issues that um, remain to be addressed and you've been very open about the fact that whilst this represents a, a breakthrough, um, you know, a, a, a lot more work needs to be done in this area. Uh, a couple of things you mentioned was uh, uh, a certain sort of uh, Wi-Fi system needs to be developed. And you also mentioned that the whole area of uh, tissue damage needs to be addressed. Could you talk about those two things, please? Yes, so the electrodes that we're now using, they are stiff silicon electrodes. So, and there is, <clears throat> sort of a mechanical mismatch between the, uh, the brain tissue, which is soft and a stiff rod. And the impression has been, although this is not very well documented, is that this mismatch in mechanical properties causes kind of sort of sliding between the electrode and the brain tissue that then results in the buildup of, um, of tissue, glial tissue, sort of fibrous tissue that pushes the nerve cells away from, from the electrodes and thereby making it more difficult to stimulate the neurons. So one way to go that seems promising is to use other materials that are much softer. Uh, so one of them is polyimid, which is a sort of a plastic of which you can make very thin wires. And they seem then to be causing less damage than those silicon rods. So that's one. Um, area where developments are currently taking place that look quite promising. The other uh, point that you uh, asked me to reflect upon is on wireless systems. So also there, there is tremendous development. So there are systems that allow uh, researchers to communicate with the brain 
putting something under the skin and something above the skin uh, that have enough bandwidth basically that allow communication as a, at a high enough rate to make that possible. But also there, there are definitely some, some developments to be uh, further taken. The recent research that you've spoken about in your paper, I believe, has focused on using um, animals um, to test this technology. At what point, although I know that uh, similar technologies have also been tested in humans, when do you see the earliest time that you can transition from animals to humans? Because, uh, of course, um, there are many movements in the world that um, are against animal testing um, and whether it causes pain or not, there's a, a great deal of discomfort about it. I'm just wondering what the plans are to transition this to humans. So it would not be ethical to just do this in humans and just hope the best. Right? So most people I talk to think that you first have to thoroughly test this and uh, some of this testing involves animals. And in this particular research, we had to use monkeys because they are the closest to humans. And in the monkeys, we could really test whether if we stimulate a pattern of electrodes in the visual cortex, they could recognize that as a pattern. Could not have been done in another species. Um, now in collaboration um, and actually mainly driven by researchers in Spain in Elche, Eduardo Fernandez, who is also a co-author on our paper, we actually tested the same approach already in one human patient. There was an MIT tech review about it recently. And the good news is that many of these same uh, stimulation patterns that we tried in the monkeys also appear to work in this, in this particular individual. So we're actually already making the step. But if we want to use other electrode materials and also wireless chips, again, we first have to demonstrate that they can be used safely and some of these things you can test without animals, but some of these tests really involve animals. And the, it's even the legal requirement to demonstrate that this works in animals. And I think that's also only the only ethical way to do it. You cannot just put something in a human and hope for the best. Um, the idea of the audience um, is comprised of the general public, um, future innov innovators uh, and creators, as well as the actual people who are shaping our, our world, uh, the space industry right the way through to science, arts and philosophy. Um, it would be really interesting to hear at this point, uh, particularly for um, future innovators within your sector, to hear a little bit about your human story and your journey to this point. And as far as uh, who maybe sparked your interest in this area um, and um, who influenced you and the choices you made along the way to get here? Okay, that's a very broad question. Um, so I started studying medicine and at some point I didn't see myself as a medical doctor. <clears throat> so I was really interested in, in science. And then I read a book, uh, it's called Gödel Escherbach, written by Douglas Hofstetter, which was mainly about consciousness. And I thought this is a really interesting topic that I want to spend uh, time on. And this is uh, what I really would like to do. So then at some point during my studies, I already started to do some neuroscience work just as a volunteer. Uh, then I uh, already applied to do a PhD project with uh, Wolf Singer, uh, uh, back then a Max Planck director, uh, director of a Max Planck Research Institute in Frankfurt. He said, well, why don't you first finish your studies? So that's what I did. I went back to the Netherlands or to where I studied and um, I uh, completed my studies hoping that he would remember that he said that I would be welcome in, in, in his lab after I completed my studies and he had not forget, forgotten. So I was really pleased to be part of his lab. And he was probably one of the people who influenced me a lot because I had a wonderful time uh, doing a PhD research in, in that lab. Uh, and after that, yeah, I just continued in neuroscience. I, I did a lot of work just on pure vision, just trying to understand how vision works. And um, through those studies, I think I started to read also more about prosthetics. 
Another person that I uh, enjoyed talking to and who influenced me is Jens Naumann. He was one of the people in the program of Bill Dobell, who also had the visual prosthesis program. And he's one of the subjects. And uh, so he got a cortical implant. It worked, didn't work for very long, but he is still a very inspiring person. And uh, talking to him also inspired me to continue in this direction. Could you talk a little bit about the team um, that you're currently working with and their various roles in helping move this forward? Yes, so we started this visual cortical uh, prosthesis project, I think in 2014. Then uh, Sing Chen, who is the first author on the paper, joined the group and with her, we really started to do this work. We got a lot of help from a company, BlackRock Microsystems, who helped us design the implants and make sure that we could do this for 1000 channels because that what had not been done before. <clears throat> and after that, several other people joined the lab. Fung Wang, who's also a co-author on the paper. He established contact with Eduardo Fernandez. I already mentioned him. They're doing this work in, in Spain. Uh, and now the team that works on visual prosthesis is about uh, six people in the lab. Uh, we also started a company, Phosphenix, because we realized that if you really want to put something in patients, you also need a commercial uh, entity um, for various regulatory issues. Peter Rolf Seema, thank you very much for your time and thank you for moving the human story forward. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks. Thanks a lot. It was my pleasure.